Be concerned about your brother. You may not be on strike, but either we go up together or we go down together. Let us develop a kind of dangerous unselfishness. One day a man came to Jesus and he wanted to raise some questions about some vital matters of life. At points he wanted to trick Jesus and show him that he knew a little more than Jesus did and throw him off base. Now that question could have easily ended up in a philosophical and theological debate. But Jesus quickly pulled that question from midair and placed it on a dangerous curve between Jerusalem and Jericho. All right. All right. And he, talk, he talked about a certain man who fell among thieves. And you remember that a Levite and a priest passed by on the other side. Yeah. They didn't stop to help him. And finally, another man of a race, another man from another race came by. He got down from his beast. And he decided not to be compassionate by proxy. Yeah. He got down from it and administered first aid and helped the man in need. And Jesus ended up saying, this was the good man. This was the great man. Yeah. Yeah. Because he had the capacity to project the I into the thou and to be concerned about his brother. Yeah. Now, you know, we use our imagination a great deal to try to determine why the priest and the Levite didn't stop. Times we say that they were busy going to a church meeting, an ecclesiastical gathering, and that they had to go down to Jerusalem so that they wouldn't be late for their meeting. Yeah. At other times, we would speculate that there was a religious law that one who engaged in a religious ceremony was not to touch a human body 24 hours after the ceremony. Yeah. And every now and then we begin to wonder whether maybe they were going down to Jerusalem or down to Jericho rather to organize a Jericho Road Improvement Association. That's a possibility. Maybe they felt that it was better to deal with the problem at the causal root rather than to get bogged down with an individual effect. But I'm going to tell you what my imagination tells me. It's possible that those men were afraid. You see, the Jericho Road is a dangerous road. I remember when Mrs. King and I were first in Jerusalem. We rented a car and drove from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And as soon as we got on that road, I said, said to my wife, I can see why Jesus used this, this setting for his parable. It's a winding, meandering road. It's really conducive for ambush. You start out in Jerusalem, which is about 1,200 miles or rather 1,200 feet above sea level. And by the time you get down to Jericho 15 to 20 minutes later, you are about 2,200 feet below sea level. That's a dangerous road. In the days of Jesus, it was known as the Bloody Pass. And you know, it's possible that the priest and the Levite looked over that man on the ground and wondered if the robbers were still around. Or it's possible they felt that the man on the ground was merely faking yeah. and that he was acting like, he, like he'd been robbed and hurt in order to seize them over there, uh -huh. lure them there for quick and easy seizure. Oh. And so the first question that the priest asked, and the first question that the Levite asked is, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? Yes. But then the Good Samaritan came by. And he reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? That's the question before you tonight. That's the question before you tonight. Not if I stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to my job? Not if I stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to all my hours that I spend in my office every day and every week as a pastor? The question is not, if I stop to help this man in need, what will happen to me? Yeah. The question is, if I do not stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to them? Yeah. That's the question. Yeah. 
Let us rise up tonight with a greater readiness. Yeah. Let us stand with a greater determination. Yeah. And let us move on in these powerful days, yeah. these days of challenge, to make America what it ought to be. We have an opportunity to make America a better nation. And I want to thank God once more for allowing me to be here with you. You know, several years ago, I was in New York City autographing the first book that I had written. And while sitting there autographing books, a minute black woman came up. The only question I heard from her was, are you Martin Luther King? And I was looking down right and I said yes. The next minute I felt something beating on my chest. Before I knew it, I had been stabbed by this demented woman. I was rushed to Harlem Hospital. It was a dark Saturday afternoon. And the tip of the blade was on the edge of my aorta, the main artery. And once that's punctured, you drowned in your own blood, that's the end of it. It came out in the New York Times the next morning that if I had merely sneezed, I would have died. Well, about four days later, they allowed me, after the operation, after the blade had been taken out and my chest had been opened, they allowed me to move around in the wheelchair in the hospital. They allowed me to read some of the mail that had came in, and from all over the states and the world, kind letters came in. I read a few of them, but one of them I will never forget. I had received uh, letters from the president and the vice president, but I had forgotten what those telegrams said. I had received a visit and a letter from the governor of New York, but I had forgotten what that letter said. But there was another letter. It came from a little girl, a young girl, who was a student at the White Plains High School. And I looked at that letter, and I'll never forget it. It read simply, Dear Dr. King, I am a ninth grade student at the White Plains High School. And she said, while it should not matter, I would like to mention that I'm a white girl. I read in the paper of your misfortune and of your suffering. And I read that if you had sneezed, you would have died. And I'm simply writing you to say that I am so happy that you didn't sneeze. I want to say tonight that I too am happy that I didn't sneeze because if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1960. When students all over the South started sitting in at lunch counters. And I knew that as they were sitting in, they were really standing up for the best of the American dream and taking the whole nation back to those great wells of democracy which were dug deep by the founding fathers of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, if I had Steve. Would have been around here in 1961 when we decided to take a ride for freedom and ended segregation and interstate travel. If I had Steve. In 1962, yeah. Negroes in Albany, Georgia, decided to straighten their backs up. Yeah. Whenever men and women straighten their backs up, they're going somewhere because a man can't ride your back unless it is bent. If I had sneezed, yeah. I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1963. Yeah. Yeah. Black people of Birmingham, Alabama, Roused the conscience of this nation and brought into being the Civil Rights Bill. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have had a chance later that year in August to try to tell America about a dream that I had had. If I had sneezed, if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been down in Selma, Alabama to see the great movement there. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been in Memphis to see a community rally around those brothers and sisters who were suffering. I'm so happy that I didn't sneeze. And they were telling me 
No, it doesn't matter now. It really doesn't matter what happens now. I left Atlanta this morning, and as we got started on the plane, there were six of us. The pilot said over the public address system, we are sorry for the delay. But we have Dr. Martin Luther King on the plane, and to be sure that all of the bags were checked. And to be sure that nothing would go wrong on the plane, we had to check out everything carefully. And we've had the plane protected and guarded all night. And then I got into Memphis. And some began to say the threats, or talk about the threats that were out. What would happen to me from some of our sick white brothers? Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody would like to live, a long life, longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will and he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. 